A very good evening to the dear CCI family, audience, pulmonologists, and physicians across India. I'm Dr. Kirat Kaur Sibya, consultant pulmonologist at SPS Hospitals Ludhiana, and your host for today's webinar. We have the much awaited webinar today, that is, the webinar on autoimmune lung diseases, and the cast couldn't have been better. We have the most beloved cast here, which has been chosen personally by Dr. Enet Krishna, whose brainchild is today's webinar topic. First of all, I would like to welcome our speaker for today's webinar, Dr. Rajadhar. Sir is the Dronacharya for most, for all pulmonologists in India. He is the most beloved teacher. He is the director pulmonology at CK Birla Hospitals, Kolkata. Welcome, Dr. Rada, there, sir. <clears throat> Next, we have Dr. Murli Mohan, sir. Sir is the Einstein of CCI, as Dr. Krishna lovingly has referred to him recently. Dr. Murli is the consultant pulmonologist at Narayan Ridalia, Bangalore. And we are delighted to have Dr. Murli Mohan, sir, with us today. Welcome, sir. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Shah Jahan, who's here with us. Dr. Shah Jahan is Professor of Pulmonary Medicine at TD Government Medical College at Alafuza. <laughs> Sir, welcome to today's webinar. We are delighted that you are here with us today. I would now like to invite or uh, welcome our two star speakers. Uh, one is Dr. Pratibha Singhal, from Bombay Hospital, Dr. Pratibha has also been the star of intervention pulmonology and inspiring most of us. I would say most of us because whoever has met her, she leaves an everlasting uh, impression on their memory. Dr. Pratibha, welcome. Dr. Pratibha is consultant at Bombay Hospital, Mumbai. I would now like to welcome Dr. Apar Jindal. Dr. Appa Jindal is the director of a lung transplant unit at MGM Chennai. Dr. Appa, we are delighted to have you here with us today. And we look forward to some questions which I think only you can answer. And we look forward to learning a lot from you today. Welcome, sir. And now I would like to invite, welcome our special guest, CCI's guest, that is Dr. Bindyachal Gupta. Sir is consultant rheumatologist at Ranchi Rheumatology Center. Dr. Bindyachal, we look forward to having a meaningful learning experience with you today. Welcome to the CCI platform. Now, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Rajadhar to please begin his talk. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Kirat. Um, uh, lovely words, kind words, a big hello to the CCI family. Um, I'll set the ball rolling today and I'll give a talk which would hopefully set the tone between this disease overlap between rheumatology and pulmonology. I've called this a multi-compartment disease and then the assessment of connective tissue diseases and where should a respiratory physician begin? For some of you, it's going to be a basic talk, but I think to get the ball rolling, a basic talk is probably something that we would desire. So apologies if some of what I'm going to say seems very simple to you. So this is what I'm going to do over the next 18 odd minutes. I'm going to show you the spectrum of autoimmune rheumatic disease. And in that context, I'll talk to you about the scope of pulmonary complications in these disease spectra. I'm going to talk a little bit about presentation and diagnosis, and then you're going to hear much more in the two cases that discussion with our eminent panel. In talking about the prototypic multisystem diseases with ILD, my focus will be on systemic sclerosis, but I'll also mention other diseases like inflammatory myopathies, SLE, 
mixed connective tissue diseases, and I'll talk a little bit in passing about vasculitis. So that's the spectrum of diseases that you would encounter in the context of autoimmune diseases. So we'll start off talking about scleroderma because that's where the, most of the evidence lies in the umbrella of uh, autoimmune diseases. So when you talk about scleroderma, you talk about interstitial lung disease, but you also talk about aspiration pneumonia related to esophageal dysfertility. You talk about pulmonary hypertension and in systemic sclerosis, the pulmonary hypertension could be group one pulmonary hypertension. So in the category of idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, but it could also be group three or group two pulmonary hypertension that's related to interstitial lung, uh, uh, interstitial lung disease or due to left heart disease. We're going to talk about polymyositis, dermatomyositis, and there you have interstitial lung disease, but along with it, you might also have respiratory muscle weakness. And if you look at the proportion of people with interstitial lung disease versus respiratory muscle weakness, interestingly, the ratio lies at about one is to one with respiratory muscle weakness being less diagnosed or undiagnosed in a lot of cases. If you look at rheumatoid arthritis, which is another big basket, the biggest number there is interstitial lung disease followed closely with pleural diseases, the pleural effusions. There's also bronchiolitis obliterans. And again, a lot of diseases which are related to the drugs that are given with uh, in um, rheumatoid arthritis. And I'm sure Dr. Vindhyachal will talk to an extent about drug-induced interstitial lung disease in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And then you have anchor vasculitis, you have SLE, but there's a whole host of diseases related to the lung. However, interstitial lung diseases are less common, uncommon in patients with systemic lupus erythematosus. So now that we have the various disease processes, let's look at the histologic pa patterns of idiopathic interstitial pneumonia in the category of CTDs. And by far, the commonest disease that you have is fibrotic NSIP. So the pluses there in that chart indicate the prevalence of the disease process. And you can see at number one, you have non-specific interstitial pneumonia. And closely followed by this, you have a UIP pattern. So NSIP followed by UIP. And then there are other disease processes which are less common within the histological patterns of IIP in CTDs. So let's now look at it from a rheumatologist's perspective. So when you have patients presenting with autoimmune diseases, the reason the diagnosis is a challenge for a rheumatologist or a physician or a pulmonologist to whom the patient might present to is because the symptoms are generalized. They are systemic symptoms. They are generally quite weak and nonspecific. So the commonest symptoms are fatigue, arthralgia. We'll come to Raynaud's in slightly greater detail, but Raynaud's phenomenon, you've got alopecia. You might have a rash, photosensitive rashes. And in lab examinations, a lot of these patients have anemia. A smaller proportion, but a definite and a significant proportion of patients present with organ-based complications. A smaller, even a smaller proportion might actually not have the systemic symptoms or the rheumatological symptoms I spoke about, but only present with the organ-specific complications I spoke about. And in that ambit, you have lung disease, pulmonary complications right at the top, just beneath renal. So remember, there's a small proportion of patients who would present with you with pulmonary symptoms and you look back and you find that this is secondary to a connective tissue disease. When you think about investigating patients with autoimmune rheumatic diseases, there's a whole spectrum of disease uh, uh, investigations that you might want to do. And go to a very simple list, which is probably compulsory for you to do. So you start off with doing a full blood count. You do get look at inflammatory markers like CRP. You would do a urine analysis where you're basically looking for blood. You're looking for CAS and you're looking for protein. In serum biochemistry, you hold, do the whole spectrum, but especially the muscle markers like CK are important to do. In radiology, you have the chest X-ray. You would do an HRCT in all of these cases where you have a suspicion of interstitial lung disease. Then you might end up doing a skeletal survey because of the underlying autoimmune disease that you're trying to diagnose. And then you have an autoimmune serology where there's a whole list of tests 
but the important ones are the ANA, the rheumatoid factor, the anti-CCP antibody, and if there are suggestive symptoms, you would do up, uh, end up doing an anti-DSTNA in these patients. The commonest symptom which this overlap group presents with, the patients with autoimmune disease with lung manifestations, is Raynaud's phenomenon. Raynaud's phenomenon, interestingly, is presented 5% of the normal population. And typically, these are patients who are young, who have a family history of Raynaud's, and are otherwise healthy individuals with their autoimmune markers being negative. Out of this 5% population, about 50% would develop an autoimmune rheumatic disease going forward. And that's important to remember. That's why identification of Raynaud's phenomenon, even in normal individuals, is something that's important. It predates autoimmune diseases in a small proportion or a significant proportion of cases. If you look at individual disease processes and you look at Raynaud's phenomenon, systemic sclerosis and Raynaud's phenomenon go hand in hand. It's almost constant. You can see a prevalence of 95% with a frequency of Raynaud's in patients with systemic sclerosis. In mixed connective diseases, it's about 85%. And then the number goes down as you go down dermatomyositis and rheumatoid arthritis. This is an infrared thermography which looks at Raynaud's, often Raynaud's in our clinical practice is established on the basis of a history. However, this is an infrared thermography where you look at Raynaud's phenomenon response to a cold challenge. And with a cold channel, normally the Raynaud's, the cold hands go away in a matter of 10 minutes. If they prolong beyond 15 minutes on infrared thermography, as you see on that photograph, it's diagnostic of Raynaud's phenomenon. However, well, let me repeat, most often for a pulmonologist, Raynaud's phenomenon would be based on a history. The other thing which is of great importance is looking at the nail flow vascularity. And in individuals who are ANA positive, which is 90% of patients with systemic sclerosis, macroscopic examination of the nail bed might actually uh, show you nail fold capillaritis. However, capillaroscopy, which is the investigation which to look at the nail fold has various patterns and looking at these patterns you can detect early stage versus late stage systemic sclerosis and Raynaud's phenomenon with ANA being positive plus a systemic sclerosis pattern on nail vasculopathy gives you an 80 percent predictive value of systemic sclerosis and a 60-fold increased risk of future systemic sclerosis unless you've diagnosed systemic sclerosis already. So I'll repeat that because that's important. It's information that you need to remember. So Raynaud's phenomenon with ANA positivity plus a systemic sclerosis pattern on nail vascular capillary um, capillaroscopy along with, so these three patterns gives you 80% predictive value for systemic sclerosis and a 60-fold higher risk of future systemic sclerosis. Now, if you look at the entire spectrum of uh, systemic sclerosis, 33% have diffuse systemic sclerosis, and you can see the classical tightening of the skin. You can see the edema, the scleredema that's synonymous with this condition, and then the limited cutaneous variety, which is 66% of cases and comes with all the features that are on this slide, the telangiectasia, the nail vasculopathy, the calcinosis, etc. So based on this, the ULAR classification, which I'm sure Dr. Vindhyachal will allude to in great detail, this was an expert consensus, which was first used in 1980 and then has been updated on multiple occasions. And it helps to exclude other diseases in the classification with the new criteria. So if you have the classic scleredema along with the nail fold vascular changes as shown in the figure, you get a nine which clinches the diagnosis of systemic sclerosis. However, there are other features which give you various scores. And if it adds up to nine or more, you also have a, a diagnosis of systemic sclerosis. In the middle, you see where my uh, pointer is. You see interstitial lung disease in scleroderma, and you can see that gives you a score of two. So that with an ANA positivity, that with the nail fold vascular changes together add up and might give you a diagnosis of scleroderma by the by means of the ULAR classification. Why is this important? 
This is important because 50% of patients with diffuse scleroderma, the blue line at the top, so 50% of these patients will have interstitial lung disease and 25% of patients with limited scleroderma will end up having systemic scler will end up having interstitial lung disease and the survival in patients with ILD will depend on the presence of interstitial lung disease with or without pulmonary hypertension so ILD plus pulmonary hypertension gives you the worst possible prognosis the association of ANA with the various antibodies also to an extent tells you about survival and in this the SCL70 or the topoisomerase 1 antibody gives you the greatest predictive value. I know I'm almost out of time. Uh, so I'll finish in the next two minutes if uh, that's okay, Kirat. So a couple of minutes talking about inflammatory myopathies. So that's the list in front of you. Here, the diagnosis is on the basis of the Bohan and Peter criteria. The lung manifestations, like we said, most commonly is fibrotic NSIP and organizing pneumonia. And four of these five features on the Bohan Peter criteria, the limb girdle type of an axial type of weakness, biopsy features, a raised creatine kinase, EMG features, and the typical heliotrope and gotron papule gives you the diagnosis. So four out of five gives you a 90% predictive value for diagnosis. And that's the autoantibody mosaic. And you can see there are certain typical autoantibodies which will get discussed which will give you the greatest predictive value and also prognostication in patients with dermatomyositis and polymyositis. Systemic sclerosis, like, I, like we said, has a lot of features from the lung. However, ILD is less common. The pleural effusion, the shrinking lung syndrome, and the increased thromboembolic potential are the common features of SLE. I finish off in the last two minutes talking a little bit about the treatment of these individuals. So IPF in red, which is not the topic of discussion today, only has fibrosis and very little inflammation. And hence the treatment here is antifibrotic therapy. If you look at the non-IPF ILD, which is the character, which is the category of CTD ILDs, the blue there in the middle is inflammation. And as inflammation progresses, you get fibrosis. So the treatment would be anti-inflammatory, which is the steroid plus the immunomodulatory therapy. And then once fibrosis sets in, you would have antifibrotic therapy. So remember this one thing on one side is immunomodulatory treatment. On the other side, this fibromodulatory treatment. The study which talks about antifibrotic treatment in this category of CTD ILD is the Senesis trial, which tried nintadenib and the rate of reduction of FVC in these individuals. And they found that there was a reduction in rate of decline of FVC with the use of antifibrotic in patients with systemic sclerosis. Similar trials are now on in dermatomyositis, polymyositis, rheumatoid arthritis, and hopefully there'll be similar results. So in conclusion, I hope I have managed to tell you that this is a multi-compartment autoimmune rheumatological disease, which is rare. But pulmonary manifestations, if you have this disease, are common. The respiratory symptoms are common and they might be the presenting symptom in these individuals. Chest disease must be managed in conjunction with other disease manifestations. And we need a multidisciplinary team like we have on the panel today. Systemic sclerosis exemplifies the complexity of CTD and it provides a template for management of these patients. And the treatment, as we said, is a balance between anti-inflammatory and anti-fibrotic treatment. Thank you very much for listening to me. And I'll now hand it over to Kira to take the panel discussion forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. It's always a pleasure learning from Dr. Raja. I personally find it, I find that I can listen to Dr. Raja endlessly. It's so, uh, captivating the way sir teaches. That's what makes him an impeccable teacher. Sir, you've talked about capillaroscopy. You've talked about other investigations. I have one particular question for you. You have CPET, which very few centers in India have. Is there any role in evaluating a patient with CTD-ILD or any kind of ILD with CPET? 
it's a uh, very nice question, Kiran. So I think one of the things that you know CPET does is to distinguish between a pulmonary cause for dyspnea versus a cardiac cause of dyspnea. And diseases like scleroderma, I think, are one of the important disorders where you need to make this distinction. There are certain patients who have more of an interstitial involvement and they can be picked up on a CPET. On the other hand, you have a category of patients who have a pulmonary vasculitis, who have more of cardiac involvement in the scleroderma category, who can be actually distinguished on the basis of CPET again. So this distinction is important. Picking up early interstitial lung disease by CPET is another area which has been looked at. And you can pick up the disease early by putting these patients for CPET. So multiple indications. And I think I would probably have in a more detailed discussion mentioned CPET. So not, it's not your first investigation, but absolutely an important uh, investigation when you're trying to make this distinction between lung and cardiac disease, early interstitial lung disease, and so on and so forth. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Now I'll move forward and we'll have the, we'll share the cases that we have today. We have two very interesting cases that we're going to walk through. Uh, one is a case which has been shared by Dr. Shah Jahan and another impeccable case shared by Dr. Apar. So thank you, Dr. Apar and Dr. Shah Jahan for sharing these very interesting cases for today's webinar. And uh, may I request the host to please share my screen? Is it visible? Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. All right. So the first case that we're going to discuss, I'm going to walk through is, is the case where we had a 64-year-old male a chronic smoker with complaint of productive cough, which was persistent and there was dyspnea on exertion. And this was a history which the patient gave um, in October 2021. So he was having this problem since October 2021. He was a known case of diabetes and hypertension and there was history of appendicectomy in 1987. The patient denied any history of arthritis, renal phenomena, or any other symptoms related to arthritis or any other connective tissue disorder. This was a male patient. On examination, digital clubbing was present and on auscultation, fine end inspiratory crepitations were heard. The PFT was showing normal FEC, while the DLCO was reduced to 45% at the time of initial evaluation. His echocardiography was normal, and the HRCT showed reticular shadows characterized by bilateral basal thickening of interlobular septa associated with traction bronchiectasis and no DGOs at all. His ESR, CRP, ANA, ANCA, RF factor all were found negative, and ANA profile was also negative. Since UIP pattern was established with the presence of honeycombing, a diagnosis of IPF was made by the radiologist. And the treatment was initiated with nintinanib along with sympt symptomatic treatment. He was advised smoking cessation as well. So after a few years, that's about in after 19, uh, 20, 21, 22, after about four years in July 2022, he returned with the appearance of inflammatory arthralgias involving small joints of the hands and swelling of the right wrist associated with increased ESR and CRP was normal. There was presence of RA factor also at this point. Upon rheumatology consultation, a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis was made and the patient was started on low-dose steroid, hydroxychloroquine, and mentadanib was continued. A year later, patient had relapse of arthritis with involvement of small joints of hands and knees. ESR was raised while CRP was still normal. There was a progression of lung fibrosis on HRCT 
with an increase in of fibrosis in subdural areas and an increase in traction bronchiectasis and honeycomb however symptoms and respiratory function remained stable X-rays of the hands also showed typical bony erosions in several metacarpophalangeal joints. What would you do in such a case? What would be your next treatment option? This is what we'll be discussing shortly, and the second case that we're going to be talking about. So you can see the CT in twenty twenty one and twenty twenty three. The second case that we're going to be talking about today is. a female patient 43 year old female patient with complaint of dyspnea since 8 years gradually worsening and currently in 2023 with grade 4 mmrc dyspnea she had complaint of dry cough skin changes were present there was history of arthralgia and weakness and also history of reflux and regurgitation she was a diagnosed case she is a diagnosed case of scleroderma and she was diagnosed in 2012 uh, she was scl70 and ana positive and was treated with injectable cyclophosphamide for about a year once a month and then changed over to oral cyclophosphamide and steroid for 2 years in 2013 she presented with miniastin lymphadenopathy ebus fnac was done which was suggestive of uh, tuberculosis and then she was treated with full course of att In 2016 her respiratory symptoms got worsened radiological features were suggestive of ssc ild and there was evidence of eh she was started on mycophenolate hcq and low dose omnaphotil sildenafil and amrisentin was also added at this point she required 1 to 2 liters of oxygen on exertion and physical activities in 2016 and after that she from atot she went to ltot uh, since june 2021 when she was on oxygen at 8 liters per minute and she is currently on 10 liters of oxygen with nrbm non rebreathing there is also history of gangrene over left fourth toe which was treated with silostazole and pentoxifilin she got covid pneumonia in november 2021 when her oxygen requirement was same and then she recovered there is history of gerd she is anemic there is no history however of hypertension or diabetes in december 2021 she had abdominal aorta thrombosis with complete luminal obstruction up to aortic bifurcation there was severe stenosis of left renal artery and there was 50% stenosis of origin of sma so peri mesentic artery and mild stenosis at origin of left sciatic trunk on examination she is she is found to be pale thin built poorly nourished low bmi saturation of 95% on oxygen at 10 liters via non rebreathing mask and chest auscultation reveals diffuse bilateral crepes on upon musculoskeletal mus, uh, examination we find that renaud's phenomena is present there is hardening and tightening of skin over the face and forearm there is hyperpigmentation of skin over extremities trunk and face and there is severe distal phalangeal deformity bilaterally present and digital ulcers and calcinosis is also present here we can see the ct this ct is from feb 2019 uh, so this is the x ray for comparison we can see the disease progression over the years here is a comparison of pulmonary function test through the years so you can see the fpc has progressively decreased from 60% in 2015 to 56% in 2016 to drastically low in 2022 that is down to 39% echo was suggestive of dilated ra rv normal lb function and severe ph with a rvsp of 76 
impedance ph monitoring was also done we can expect such tests will be done by dr appa jindal thank you for sharing this sir it's a learning uh, experience for us all so we find in adequate gastric acid control significant distal esophageal acid exposure and uh, is in you know increased number of reflux episodes so the diagnosis in this case is as we all can tell by now but we have to discuss what is to be done further the diagnosis is uh, ssc ild crest syndrome severe pah old pulmonary cox and gerd and abdominal aortic thrombosis may i also add history of uh, gangrene as well so thank you so we'll now start with the discussion my first question is dr pratibha here yes so my first question is for dr pratibha dr pratibha whenever you get a patient of rheumatoid arthritis how would you evaluate such a case for dysnia thank you kirat uh, i thank cci for inviting me here uh, raja has already extensively uh, spoken about a lot of things which we will again discuss over here some of them so i think two common things which can cause dysnia and rheumatoid arthritis is respiratory and cardiovascular uh, involvement so what we are basically looking at is looking at the history how do, which will help us figure out whether it is a primary respiratory pathology that is causing dyspnea or it is a cardiovascular involvement that is causing dyspnea so you are going to do uh, other than the history you are going to ask for uh, whether there is associated cough which will help you elucidate that it is a respiratory involvement causing dyspnea you will do an x ray you could do. i i see a lot of people uh, in fact two days ago there is a doctor who has come 75 year old for some surgical uh, you know posted for some surgery who has rheumatoid arthritis since many years on hcq and methotrexate and she's not undergone a single hrct even though she has intermittent cough and when we did a ct yesterday it showed that it had an interstitial lung disease pattern so i think this is the thing that we need to see is very often you have occult interstitial lung disease in these patients which often gets missed if we don't evaluate with a lung function test or a hrct screening which should be advised in these patients at some point i think the case that you described was a very important case because in that patient the respiratory symptoms were before the arthralgia symptoms and therefore the patient had got labeled as ipf and in we see that in clinical practice about 10 to 20% of patients can have respiratory manifestations before the arthralgia uh, comes up and these patients often are mislabeled and misdiagnosed as ipf however i think here it is important that you look at the age of the patient and carefully look at uh, you know uh, how as a routine practice that we do sometimes we rule out all the uh, ctd as part of your investigation panel you look at your uh, immunological workup i think that is an important thing here sometimes when it is not clinically fitting into ipf clearly maybe we can pick up these cases early why are we talking so much about these things is because there its mortality can be as high as 6 to 10% and in fact when there is a uip pattern it is seen that there is not much difference in mortality compared to ipf we used to think that our, uh, you know rheumatoid arthritis ild will have less mortality but uh, if it is an ra uip pattern the mortality has now been seen to be very similar to ipf so it is important to target and treat these patients on time some other manifestations of ra involvement in the lung could be small incidence of effusions which can cause dyspnea there could be rheumatoid nodules which can affect the vocal cords or even in the lungs which can sometimes give rise to dyspnea so appropriate investigations and history would be uh, you know helping us again a ct scan will help us figure out what is the cause of dyspnea occasionally you can have constrictive bronchiolitis as a manifestation obstructive airway disease however we see that constrictive bronchiolitis as a manifestation of uh, ra ild is more likely to be related to drugs rather than the uh, disease itself so that's what i would look at i would look at whether it's a cardiac manifestation versus a pulmonary manifestation and do the basic screening protocol of getting a lung function test done including a diffusion capacity because sometimes you can have a dlc or low 
prior to having an FEC loop, which can be missed if you do a simple spirometry and a HRCT screening, along with a complete assessment clinically. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I think uh, the take home point is that you clearly mentioned that about 10 to 20 percent people will present with uh, ILD or with lung symptoms or lung disease in RA before they get arthralgia. And 90 percent are going to have arthralgia onset first, right? And another yes. thing that you uh, elaborated that there can be other causes of dyspnea in like uh, nodules and then you, there can be pleural effusion, cardiac and pulmonary both. We have a different spectrum. So what I really think everyone needs to keep in their mind is that it is not just CTD, ILD, but other presentations as well. A patient with RA could also come with a pneumothorax. So to keep that in mind and evaluate a patient, even when arthralgias may or may not be present. So the next question I would like to ask here, you mentioned, ma'am, uh, you know, FVC. And uh, so I noticed that in this case, uh, there was normal FVC, but DLCO was low. It was 45%. So Dr. Shah Jahan, do you generally order DLCO even when baseline spirometry is not suggestive of restriction? Also, I would like to ask you that when do you order and how do you order, PF, order PFTs in a case of CTD, ILD? or suspected CTD ILD. You need to unmute, sir. You need to unmute, Dr. Apar, uh, Dr. Shah Jahan. Sorry, sorry, sorry. At the outset, I thank uh, CCA family for this uh, wonderful opportunity to discuss on a very important, but often neglected or in the last minute discussion topics. Uh, to come in the forefront of CCA webinar. Thank you. Uh, DLC with the normal spirometry can occur in a varied clinical conditions. For example, in mild emphysema, early ILDs, or pulmonary vascular disease. So, a normal spirometry does not rule out the possibility of a lung disease, as we all know. And in patients, is the dyspnea of unknown cause. The pattern of low DLC with the normal spirometry uh, usually, the likelihood of pulmonary, it is an indication of pulmonary vascular disease. But of course, this pattern can occur with several ILDs as well. And we all know that the changes in DLC occur much before the structural damage develops, whether it is ILD or whatever it may be. It is a highly sensitive test, uh, underutilized uh, test, and poorly understood test, DLCO. Because it is cumbersome, many a time it is cumbersome. But spirometry is being done like anything. So whenever a patient presented with an unexplained dyspnea or in the background of ILD, DLCO is to be measured even if spirometry is not done. So in our case also, our spirometry was found to be normal, but the patient gives features suggestive of ILD, exertional dyspnea and all this. So we wanted to do DLC also because whenever you plan uh, uh, <coughs> evaluation of this patient, uh, spirometry alone is not at all sufficient. In all cases, DLC are also to be done, though it is not specific. So another thing that uh, whenever you plan uh, autoimmune disorders where lung involvement is suspected, to uh, do DLCO, it is not that much costly. It is most of the time available in most of the centers. Uh, no risk of radiation on all these things, simple tests. So we have to do because we will get a valuable information by doing spirometry plus DLCO. Because here you are, oh, you got a normal spirometry, but a grossly reduced, that is around 45% only reduced <coughs> DLCO, which think you of some other disease. That is very, very important, I think. And uh, spirometry alone is not sufficient in such cases, I believe. Uh, another thing you asked me is regarding when you plan or how I plan uh, PFT. For example, suppose a patient comes to you with this kind of uh, symptoms. Initially itself, we do spirometry. Whether it is normal or abnormal, invariably we go for uh, DLCO2. So that is clear, I think. And uh, almost all the cases, even not even if you don't suspect ILD, if a patient coming to you with an unexplained dyspnea and you have ruled out the cardiac causes, I think it is better to do a DLCO also uh, in all the cases. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shah Jahan. Point well taken. PLCO must be done when you are dealing with unexplained dyspnea. I think I would have expected that he's a smoker. I would have expected there to be COPD, emphysema, but the CT was suggestive of ILE changes, UIP. Dr. Murli, do you want to add something here? Were you raising your hand, sir? Yeah, so a couple of other things. I think uh, Dr. Shahjan has also referred to it. I have to go to my pet area that when you have pulmonary hypertension and it's often not recognized in the presence of these CTDs, apart from vasculitis, just the presence of pulmonary hypertension will pull down your DLCO. So you'll get an apparently normal looking mm -hmm. spirometry and a low DLCO. And of course, something we've started to recognize more and more often these days is CPAP. When you have emphysema along with an interstitial lung disease, you'll get this very confusing picture, an extremely low DLCO, but apparently preserved spirometry. So those are two other conditions I'd like, uh, you know, our uh, listeners to keep in mind. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, now I would like to direct my next question to Dr. Abar. Dr. Apar, what are the CT findings you would suggest you should suspect in a patient with RILD? You need to unmute, sir. Sorry about that. Thank you, Kirat, for the question. So I thank CCI and Kirat for uh, organizing this uh, webinar. And of course, I need to applaud Raja and yourself for a beautiful presentation that you've made so far. Uh, coming back to the question that you've put across to me, the CT findings in um, ILD, I think Raja put up a very, very uh, beautiful slide over there. If we look at the various spectrums, I think fibrotic NSIP is the most common uh, you know, finding that we see in most of these HRCTs once uh, we are suspecting an ILD in these cases. Although if you look at it individually, uh, some changes may be there. Like uh, if you talk about RA-associated ILDs, UIPs are fairly very common. Uh, slightly a tad bit more common than NSIPs or if or if you have um, this uh, systemic sclerosing, which is a diffuse variant, uh, you might have exuberant honeycombing uh, changes present over here. There are certain typical findings that, uh, you know, uh, define the presence of these ILDs uh, or as we would say that it is going towards a fibrotic, progressive fibrosing ILDs. You'd see changes at the secondary lobular level, you'll see inter- uh, and intralobular septal thickenings, there would be associated traction bronchiectasis, there would be some uh, honeycombing. Now, what degree of honeycombing is there will actually uh, be another clue to differentiate it from an IPF versus a CTD ILD. And then there are certain other, you know, uh, changes which we fairly commonly observe in the CTD ILDs pictures, such as the anterior, um, you know, the upper and anterior signs. It's more of the upper lobe involvement as compared to the uh, spatially heterogeneous uh, UIP in the IPF patterns, you'll see more of the anterior segment involvement over here. So putting together, you see uh, these sort of changes where you would classify more of an NSIP versus a UIP pattern. The other commonly seen patterns over here are the OP, organizing pneumonia and the bronchiolitis obliterans pneumonia as, as well. Certain other ones, if you specifically asked me about RA, but, uh, you know, there's one specific things uh, like the Jogrens. It is commonly associated with cystic ILDs as well, where LIP patterns can also be brought in. One thing, again, getting into Dr. Murli's areas, when you have a lot of pulmonary hypertension uh, creep in, so you see some more changes appear over here. Like typically we say that if you see a lot of ground glassing, uh, you will not tend to call it a UIP. So, you know, like as Bhavin famously tries to put it that we are, let's not split it into too many buckets, but if we can put it into a variety of a progressive fibrosing ILD, where we see all these fibrotic features and we see the other features where the complications can be brought in, uh, specifically because of pulmonary hypertension or because of repeated aspiration pneumonias, it can be classified as a PFILD picture. Very well, sir. Very, uh, you've explained in quite some detail. I'm not going to repeat it. So <laughs> um, definitely, uh, I think UIP and the fact that no GGOs and the gray area, and that's something we need to look at. Um, now, my next question is for Dr. Shah Jahan. Sir, this patient was a smoker. I would also like to point out that he was a male patient. I think we tend to suspect RA more in women. And the fact that uh, the ratio in women before 50s and 
male is to female is like one is to six, and after age of fifty, sixty, it is like three years to one. So, did you suspect uh, R A I L D in the first instance? Is my first question to you, and the second question is, uh, what is the relationship, if any, between smoking and C T V S? You need to unmute, sir. Relation between smoking and connective tissue diseases. Yes. Uh, first, you asked me whether did I suspect uh, R I L D in the initial context. Because the patient presented with an uh, uh, IPF-like picture, and then the patient had a feature suggestive of uh, small joint involvement and all these things, we first consider, uh, though it is more common in women, we first consider it rheumatoid arthritis associated ILD only. Because the when we re-evaluated the case with the radiologist, with the rheumatologist, the UIP pattern, Initially, the, naturally, we, people all thought uh, IPF, but later it was come to UAP with the subplural sparing everything. We consider it could be a UAP pattern which is associated with the RILD only. Then ask, the next part of the question is that you asked me about the smoking. Of course, smoking is really, really related to connective tissue disorder ILD, and the studies have shown that the three to four fold increase among smokers. And this patient is a chronic smoker with a high smoking index back years. So uh, the likelihood of developing connected tissue ILD is naturally more when a patient smokes. So uh, a rheumatoid arthritis patient, uh, male patient, we initially suspected IPF, but the patient is a chronic smoker. Uh, only recently he stopped smoking with a high smoking index. We consider this could be, or this is uh, rheumatoid arthritis related early only. And naturally, smoking is a, re a number one independent risk factor for developing uh, connective tissue disorder, ILD, in those who arrive with uh, this kind of disorders. Thank you, sir. Dr. Bindiachal, would you like to add anything? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, we know RA is the most prevalent traumatic disease, affect 1% of the total population. When it comes to ILD, clinically, it affects 10% of the RA population. However, the changes in HRCT can be observed around 40 to 50% of cases. The smoking is one of the risk factors for development of ILD in a patient with RA. Normally, it joint pains start and it takes decades after symptom of chest, cuff, and ILD. Only five to 10% patient have a ILD as the first presentation followed by development of inflammatory arthritis. Only five to 10%. And this scenario take a little bit of confusion between a UIP or a IPF. When you get, go for a serology, when go for a, a serology, all patients who, uh, who are going to be screened for RF and antisepsis should be positive to define a RA with ILD. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So this relationship between smoking and ILDs, rather IRA, ILDs, and the fact that patients with RA would have, are more likely to have lung involvement if they're smokers, this needs to be highlighted. Um, my next question is for Dr. Apar. Dr. Apar, you must have noticed that this patient, he had low ESR, he had uh, ESR and CRP, which were negative to begin with, even RA factor, ANA, ANCA was all negative to begin with, ANA profile, extended ANA profile was negative. So were there any additional markers or any additional tests that you think which could have helped to identify or to clinch diagnosis earlier in this case? When we are talking about these markers, I think it's a big Pandora's box. There are so many markers which are already available and there are new entries which are, you know, creeping into our practice, creeping in and creeping out, I should say. Uh, but when you're specifically talking about the uh, RAILD, I think uh, a couple of uh, very important ones, especially to clinch the diagnosis, the anti-CCP is a very good marker to diagnose uh, uh, RAILD. 
you know, uh, associated with the presence of RA and the RA factor can also be used as a, you know, marker for disease activity, disease severity, and the response to treatment when you do it at a serial level. For a follow-up, I would actually like to use the RA factor level as well as the CRP and the ESR to follow up our disease activity in these patients, along with, of course, the pulmonary uh, you know, tests that we are doing, the spirometry, the DLCO, and ECHO to look at the pulmonary hypertension, what the uh, PA pressures look like, along with the CT progression of the disease. I think everything put together, rather than uh, depending upon a single marker, is what will help in uh, uh, prognosticating and monitoring the disease activity versus response to treatment for this patient. Uh, one Thank thing you. that I missed upon is the six-minute walk test. A CPET or a six-minute walk test, which you know most of us commonly have, is again a very important parameter that needs to be repeated at regular interval as well. I agree. Six-minute walk test is something which I generally go in for, not just when a patient comes to my OPD every time, but I ask them to document it at home because it's very important that the patient maintains a diary and they track their own status. It is encouraging for the patient when they realize that they are doing better, or at least they're keeping up even when they're not feeling that well. So I would like to ask Dr. Murli Mohan, sir. Sir, in this case, uh, Dr. Apart just can I talked about how- To interrupt uh, Dr. Kirat, I think Dr. Vidyanchal wanted to ask, uh, add something. Yes, yeah. sir. Regarding RAILD, uh, we know the prevalence of rheumatoid or anticipatory in a patient with established RA. It is about 70% sensitivity and for the rheumatoid factor and at the same sensitivity of anti-CCP. But when it comes to specificity, RF is about 70% specific, but the presence of anti-CCP is more than 95%. So presence of anti-CCP defines the disease is related to rheumatoid arthritis. You know, RA can be false positive and low titer positivity can be seen in, in normal individuals. Even we have chronic smokers who have a chronic infection like TB, chronic hepatitis B and C, even in CTDs, we can get a false positive rheumatoid factor. But presence of anti-CC would define the RA-related ILD. It can't be seen other than in ILD. So would you say that it, it should be a part of the initial testing? Yeah, and my so question, would it be a part in tracking disease activity as well? Uh, no, normally it, uh, in clinical scenario, monitoring is not advised yet, yet because there is no strong evidence to monitor this autoantibody level that they are not they are fluctuating and their fluctuating level like we use in anka associated vasculitis we monitor the c anka level some of the european guidelines they support you can monitor the c anka level but they are not totally accurate in predicting the clinical response or the treatment of the patient that's why monitoring in clinical practice not advised yet okay so yeah. dr murli sir would you like to add anything on how you monitor your patients, how you like to document their disease activity. I'd like to hear your experience as well, if there's something we can. So it's actually fairly complicated, but I think what we do is you need to monitor the disease activity of rheumatoid arthritis in general. You need to monitor the lung disease. You need to monitor for drug effects because all three are very important to follow up on. Uh, for the do and I think they use their own monitors of disease activity. There are various uh, scores that they use to look at the disease activity. We can also look at the ESR and the CRP, uh, and those are also useful. But from a pulmonologist's point of view, you know, I think Dr. Apar has already told us very clearly what all you look at. Uh, basically, I ask my patients every time to do a six-minute walk test. And as you correctly said, Kirat, I think we want them to do it at home also. You know, especially we learned this during COVID, uh, not only for COVID-19, but also the fact that they didn't want to come into hospital. We didn't want them to come to hospital unnecessarily. They did a lot of their monitoring and kept in touch with us from home about how their disease was progressing. Uh, the other thing is when they have an exacerbation, it's very useful to ask them to monitor their uh, six-minute walk distance. So I think uh, six-minute walk test for me is one of the key areas which I look at to monitor their disease activity. We must take into account the fact that their distance may be compromised by their uh, arthritis. So for example, if they have a lot of lower limb arthritis, their distance may, you know, may not be good enough because of their uh, arthritis rather than of the lung disease. 
So one of the things you also look at is you look at their oxygen level, how it falls, how quickly it falls, how quickly it recovers and so on. So that's as far as a six minute walk test goes. Obviously we look at lung function tests. And as I think both Dr. Shah Jahan and Apar emphasized, uh, the DLCO is something that I'd like to do fairly often. I don't do it every single time, but maybe once in six months to a year, I would definitely do the DLCO as long as a patient can do it. And as we learn from the gap index, you know, not being able to do the DLCO is also a bad sign. You know, so a person who's able to do it earlier and is not able to do it now, that's a sign that they're progressing, you know, not able to hold their breath for the required length of time and so on. So those are two key areas that I look at. Should one do a CT scan more often and, or other radiology more often? I think in the beginning, when I'm looking for evidence of progression, then I would do it. I would do it after six months usually or a year, depending on the other things that are going on, lung function tests and so on. But if you know, I'm fairly convinced that the patient is stable, I would not do a CT scan very often. Uh, I, I think that measures of function are as good as looking at a CT scan. But if I'm trying to define progression, I certainly would want to do a CT scan. And last of all, of course, uh, you know, we do an echocardiogram uh, at the beginning, and then we would repeat it after about a year. We would do it very early in a patient with systemic sclerosis uh, at when the diagnosis is made, and we would follow up fairly closely with the echo. In other patients, I would see, is there a possibility of pulmonary hypertension? Is this patient's pro, uh, symptoms disproportionate to what I'm finding? Then I would do an echo also. And finally, of course, we monitor, depending on the drug, uh, for drug effect, we would look at blood counts, LFTs, renal function, and those would be the top three that I would look at. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I um, just wanted to ask a question to uh, our rheumatologist, Dr. Bindi Achal. In the initial setting, there was no rheumatology complaints at all. I thought it was a pure IPF. So at that time, am I justified in doing an anti-CCP or am I missed it? Anti-CCP. Uh, almost be. all other tests yeah, I did. Almost all other tests of rheumatology I did. But anti-CCP I failed to do. Yeah. It shows there is no RA is the most, most prevalent disease, and we know IP you know, absolute many and diabetic drug is there. And now we want to have more autoimmune causes. If you find out the autoimmune causes, there will be more response to treatment. And RA is the most prevalent data. RA for NTC should be done. They are very good along with NA. These are the common investigation I usually do. RF, anti CCP, ANA. It's a common, these three things. Along with the clinical field, it is common. We can do this on IL. So, from what I understand uh, or what I've read, Dr. Bindyachal, isn't it that anti CCP and RA factor have similar sensitivity, but anti CCP has higher specificity? Which means most specific, more than 95%. Yeah. Specificity. But is there any difference in sensitivity yeah. when we are screening for disease? No, no. Both are, both are 70 to 80 percent sensitive. Their sensitivity is same. same. Both. Similar. Yeah. So Dr. Shah Jahan, what you were asking. So even though they have similar sensitivity, but still they should both be done. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I agree. I, I, I couldn't do that at that point of time. Even in almost all other sorts. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Pratibha, ma'am. Yeah. Even sorry, in... I got. Ah, sorry, sorry, Vindesh. Please continue. You want to add something, yeah. Doctor Pratibha? Yeah, I was just saying. Sorry, I got logged off in between. But okay. I think initially, earlier in practice, we used to not do anti CCP regularly. But off late, I think with our interaction with the colleagues, rheumatology colleagues, most of us are doing anti CCP along with RA, along with an ANA for screening of. Uh, autoimmune uh, interstitial lung disease. So I think that's a good point that we are bringing out here because often sometimes we miss doing anti-CCP. Also, also, I think one point I think uh, about uh, smoking related, I think we mentioned about rheumatoid arthritis, but I think there is some data which is not conclusive, but even in SLE that there is current smoking asso associated with increased incidence of uh, ANA or uh, DSDNA formation in uh, systemic sclerosis. So I think smoking does have some correlation with uh, not only the disease, 
but also the outcome because as dr uh, modli has also mentioned that when patients are smokers you may find that their dlc and other lung functions are more severely reduced uh, for what you see on the ct compared to non smokers like the ct and pft may be disproportionate so you clearly said ma'am your uh, what you're saying is actually absolutely right and uh, you're right and and we continue to learn from our rheumatology colleagues and taking full advantage of the fact that we have an eminent rheumatologist with us today my next question will be for dr vindyachal sir so sir upon diagnosis of ra this patient was started on low dose steroid and hcq and nintadanib was continued what is the initial agent of choice in rheumatoid arthritis how do you approach a patient of ra ild how what is your approach to management and yes. then finally i would also like you to just talk about it that what is the preferred class amongst nsaids demards steroids cytokine antagonists so could you just walk us through these uh when a patient comes out when found with any severe rheumatoid arthritis no doubt as a rheumatologist we track methods second line third line every time we use method tracked but when it comes out Are you able to listen? Are you able to hear? I think he's muted, Doctor Bindra. Doctor Bindra, you need to unmute and speak again. Yes, Doctor Bindra, you. Yeah, I think there's some signal problem. So, all right. So let's talk about this. This uh, the fact that what is the first choice? What is the first choice agent in a patient with RAILD? So, Doctor Murli, what? How do you go about in your practice? Uh, yeah, so you can hear me. I'm sorry. I yes, yes, thought I was muted hear. and I was checking. So, Doctor yeah. uh, Vindyachal, yeah. as a rheumatologist, he was talking about. Remethotrexate, methotrexate, methotrexate, which was all I could hear before. He, I could not hear him anymore. But we, as pulmonologists, have certain fears and concerns when it comes to methotrexate, and I'm sure we all share them. I would like your opinion on how what you think about this. So I, I think the problem with methotrexate is there was a lot of hype about how much of a problem it caused. Undoubtedly, there is an yeah. association between uh, methotrexate-associated interstitial pneumonia, acute or subacute, uh, and if that happens, obviously one does not want to continue with methotrexate. But I think this is overstated. The problem is over the last fifteen to twenty years, there have hardly been any studies, and there's a very good review, by the way, by Dr. Ganesh Raghu and others on uh, treatment of the RAILD, and he very specifically says that methotrexate. we cannot comment on so the problem is quite rightly uh, you know uh, you said that we are all frightened of using methotrexate in this situation so the choices are kind of limited you can start with a conventional dmrd other than methotrexate though we have used methotrexate and we've had no problems with it the one thing that we don't use is leflunamide for multiple reasons uh, and then what we do is and this, this is happen more these days uh, we either offer biologics to the patient uh, rituximab uh, uh, or abetes uh, abetemsepta these are all uh, tongue Tantus. tongue twisters i Tantus. always get confused by them we also go to and more and more these days i think rheumatologists are using it and i've been very happy with these to use something like a jack2 inhibitor uh, you know baricitinib and tofacitinib tofacitinib is available reasonably inexpensive and we use it my first choice usually is mmf uh, over azathioprine if the patient can tolerate mmf that is my usual conventional dmrd that i go to as a thioprene the patient cannot tolerate mmf especially for gi side effects or uh, liver problems i then go on to try one of the others uh, where the patient is willing to try it has no problems i tend to use a rituximab 
but more and more these days, I find in concert with my rheumatologist, we tend to start uh, baricitinib or tofacitinib. Uh, so that's that's the order in which I take it. But honestly, patients are already on uh, methotrexate. If they're tolerating it well, have no evidence of progression, then I, I tend not to stop the uh, uh, methotrexate. I just continue with it and monitor carefully. So, Dr. Bindyachal, yeah. I believe this the internet connection is good now. Sir, we would like I'm, to hear your take on agent of choice in RAILD and your approach to RAILD management. Yeah. Uh, in, a, in a patient with RA without ILD, methotrexate is the first line treatment. But when it comes to ILD, there is a much fear, concern about the toxicity with Methotrexate. It causes hypersensory pneumonitis. It has been there in the literature. There to severe single case due to methotrexate. In fact, for pulmonary person, it could be a problem because he got a cough and cough. It could be development of IAD. In severe of ILD, and there is a concern about methotrexate use. SCPSF. There is no any incidence with testicles. It is a mild drug. It is not effective in controlling synovitis. Okay, for pure ILD point of view, if it if there is a uh, when you go for ILD, whether you have active synovitis or active ILD, if both are present, rituximab will be the better choice. More my first choice because it has an, has both. It can control the disease related to joint, or it is very active in controlling the ILD. When it comes to pure ILD, when the joint presents, MMF will be the first choice for me. When it is not tolerated by patient, azotherapy can be the alternative choice. Even because it is contraindicated in pregnancy, we move to azotherapy about one to two months before planning for pregnancy. When, when concerned for biologicals, there are case reports like we refer anti DNF therapy, but there are case reports it can cause, it has a negative impact on ILD among anti-TNF therapy. So that scenario, tocilizumab, interleukin inhibitors, it is a good choice where we can use in IR. As mentioned, abatacet is a good option in with ILD and latest adjunct inhibitors, JAK inhibitors, JAK inhibitors. They are everywhere. They are very good in controlling joint activity, but their role in ILD can be defined. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Murli. Thank you, Dr. Bindayachal, for sharing your views on this because this is something which is still evolving. And yes, we all have our preferred yeah. agents that we are comfortable using. And I also feel that we are getting more and more comfortable using biologicals. I've used rituximab in a few patients and I have been, I am happy with the results. So, and they are generally patients for me who have already have had failure with other lines of treatment. So I would like to move forward now and I would like to talk about once you've started these uh, drugs and we, like in this case, we saw Dr. Sh, uh, you know, Shah Jahan that the patient had relapsed again after six months of starting methyl prayer, HCQ, and Intidanib. So I want to ask you, what are the treatment goals in RAILD? Suppose you ask me the treatment goals in asthma or COPD, it is very easy to tell. But in uh, rheumatoid arthritis ILD because there are no generalized care lines or consensus with regards to goals. Uh, we all know that uh, RILD is a crippling disease with uh, multi-system involvement. And generally speaking, goals include, first of all, control of symptoms because patient may be in sick with pain, dyspnea, or cough, etc., etc. So the control of symptoms is most important. And <coughs> to prevent or more realistically speaking, to arrest the progression of the lung damage and joint damage. And obviously, we have to prevent acute exacerbation because acute exacerbation is a downhill cocos, downhill course in any history of uh, ILD, whether it is rheumatoid arthritis ILD or whatever, whatever ILD. And prevent the infection is again important. Maximize quality of life and ability to perform, again important. Disability limitation and minimize the side effects of therapy because most of this has already mentioned uh, azathioprine can cause problems, uh, cyclophosphate can cause problems. Even people are worried about methotrexate. All these 
So minimize the side effect of therapy, whether with the combination or utilizing uh, in the strategic way in logistics. So these are all very important. But we should realize that achieving this is difficult, especially in the later stages. And so early identification of these kind of uh, disorders or underlying disorders is important. That is why uh, we have to do anti-CCP. Now we le- learned a lesson. We have to do anti-CCP also in the initial setting. But at the same time, we should treatment should be tailored according to the needs and the of the patient as well as the disease activity of the patients. Uh, I need speaking a combined decision of the com- pulmonologist rheumatologist and the other specialties assigned and decade is the need of the hour to achieve this goal. Uh, with the, the most modern medications, uh, we, I think uh, a significant percentage of the patient can achieve all this, but still we have to realize that RIL is a crippling disease. Uh, many of our patients over a period of time go off to crippling. That is a sad state of affairs. So your patient that you you know so graciously shared with us. So this patient had worsening of CT. He had worsening of PF. No, but no worsening of PFTs. No worsening in mm-hmm. symptoms. There was worsening of joint erosion with you know erosion of the joint arthralgias. But so Doctor Vindyachal, if a patient has raised ESR, CRP is normal. Patient is not symptomatic. He is not feeling the pain. He is not feeling breathless or increase in breathlessness. Would you still want to increase or change, uh, you know, change the drug? I think it's very difficult at this stage to even uh, offer more expensive drugs because the patient, if they don't feel the need for it, they'll not understand that the disease till it worsens, it gets bad. That they they are in for a progression. No, isolated increase in the ESR in uh, still didn't, didn't uh, matlab, additional or any dose in the modification. I test ESR sufficient to increase the dose of the drug or you change the drug. Not we so don't saying, prefer. Isolated increase in ESR has no value. Is that what you're saying? Kirat, I think there is an issue with uh, Dr. Bindyachal's connectivity. So just to yes. jut in, I think uh, are sending a text that there are about a thousand people logged in watching us. But uh, Kirat, just requesting you, it's already 9.15. Let's so we'll go to the next case then. Yes. So we'll do that. But I must ask Dr. Murli Mohan one question. Sir, Dr. Murli Mohan, sir, is every case of PAH in a patient with ILD secondary PAH? What is your approach? What is the pearl? So I think we will partly answer this. So, sorry, uh, please finish, Dr. K. That I. Sir, the clinical pearls which we must take away from you today on PAH. Every PAH, so, secondary is PAH or no in a case of ILD? Okay, so if you look at PAH in any patient with ILD, but especially um, with connective tissue disease associated ILD, Uh, I think it's important to recognize that it could be either group one or group three. I prefer not to use the terms primary and secondary any longer because we've got this nice grouping. So, but, but you're absolutely right. You know, it can be secondary to the interstitial lung disease or it can be associated with the connective tissue disorder. So we use those terms these days. Group one associated PAH where the disease is in the best themselves and that is particularly called systemic sclerosis with uh, Dr. Apar's case that you had uh, shown us earlier. The other of course is where there is lung damage enough to cause uh, problems with the oxygenation and in rheumatoid arthritis for example it may be RAILD and uh, you know I think has already mentioned both by Raja and Dr. Bidyanchal because up to 40% of patients you get a UIP pattern. So in such patients, you tend to get quite a lot of uh, lung damage, which can lead to hypoxia. But there are other things that happen in uh, rheumatoid arthritis. It can involve everything from the upper airway to the pleura, you know, so that's a wide 
variety of uh, effects that it can have on the lung. One of the things that's particularly important, not very common, but important is obliterative bronchiolitis, which can also lead, you know, with being a predominantly small airways disease, can lead to hypoxia and that can trigger off uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension, which, you know, as you said, is secondary to the lung disease. So we call it group three pulmonary hypert hypertension these days. Plus, there can be other problems. You know, you can get heart involvement because of rheumatoid arthritis. You can get a myocarditis. You can get involved with the vessels. You can get a rheumatoid associated coronary artery vasculitis. So it'll become a group two pulmonary hypertension in that case. You can get an increased risk of clotting, uh, which therefore becomes a group four uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension. So we really have a whole spectrum of pulmonary hypertension that's associated with connective tissue disorders. But the classic example is systemic sclerosis. And I think when we discuss that case, we can come back to it. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And as Dr. Pa just pointed out, we are delighted that we have more than 1,000 people who are here with us live today. Thank you for all the love and faith in CCI that you join every Thursday. And we are committed to make sure that you get knowledge and camaraderie along the way. It would be only fair to all our viewers that we should talk about and discuss in detail the next very uh, interesting and I would say rather difficult case that Dr. Apar has so graciously shared with us. Um, I would like to open the question on the next case with Dr. Shah Jahan. Dr. Shah Jahan, sir, what are the uh, expected findings, CT findings in a case with the uh, SSC ILD? Uh, in in RILD, the UAP pattern is the common we have seen, but in systemic sclerosis ILD, it is the NSIP pattern is the common pattern. Though UAP pattern is also seen. This ground glass, the peripheral ground glass opacities are the most common abnormalities associated with the interlobular septal thickening, <coughs> intralobular septal thickening, reticular opacities, honeycombing, traction bronchiectasis, bronchial ectasis nodules, etc., etc., are seen with the juxtaplural, posterior, and basal predilections. Despite many similarities between systemic sclerosis, ILD, and IPF, both can be differentiated to great extent by the HRCT pattern because ground glassing is seldom seen in IPF. If at all seen, it is only minimal. But extensive ground glassing is seen in systemic sclerosis, ILD, and also the fibrosis in systemic sclerosis ILD is less cause when compared to IPF. So we can have a fibrosis score and we can say whether it is more in favor of IPF or systemic sclerosis ILD. Next important thing is that a dilated air-filled esophagus with a diameter more than 10 millimeter is suggestive of esophageal dysmotility and commonly seen in systemic sclerosis ILD. But we were in older people, for example, in more than people with 65 years or so, you can have this dilated esophagus also. But otherwise, a dilated esophagus, more than 10 millimeters, uh, the, in the clinical context, is high likelihood of systemic sclerosis ILD is likely. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I would now like to talk uh, about Raynaud's phenomena. Dr. Rajadhar explained about Raynaud's in quite some detail. I would like to ask Dr. Pradeva, ma'am. Ma'am, what are the clinical features which must be looked for when suspecting systemic sclerosis and why it is important to seek a history of Renaud's phenomenon? Thank you, Kirat. So, uh, as Dr. Rajadhar has already said, that Renaud's phenomena is intrinsically present in almost 95% of patients of systemic sclerosis. And it is one of the most early manifestations which very often patients don't realize and they don't seek help for it. So what basically is Raynaud's is an uh, excessive vasoconstriction in the fingers and toes, which leads to skin discoloration, especially triggered by cold and stress. So we should ask patients of this uh, phenomenon because if it is present that it is almost always either a systemic sclerosis or a connective tissue a mixed connective tissue disorder. It can, however, be present in even 40% of patients with uh, SLE. There could be other causes of Raynaud's also, but when you're suspecting a connective tissue disorder, one cannot miss the history of Raynaud's. 
Now, why is it important? Is because it is not only physically debilitating to patients, but eventually over time, patients can develop, uh, 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 you know, fingertip ulcers, which are very painful. If there is continuous, uh, these are non-treated sometimes, and if it is severe, it can even lead to uh, digital gangrene. So it is very important that this is picked up, and this is one of the common things that are seen in early. Uh, connective tissue disorder, especially systemic sclerosis, when even other systemic manifestations may not be seen. Thank you, Dr. Pratima. Thank you very much. And my next question is for Dr. Bindiachal. So Dr. Bindiachal, what are the initial markers for systemic sclerosis and which additional serological tests should be ordered and when they should be ordered? Uh. It is very important because uh, among the rheumatic diseases, systemic sclerosis has the highest mortality due to IR. So it is very, very important to diagnose the patient in the early stage so we can prevent the development of complication. Renote the first sign, which is can be the stage of systemic sclerosis. Along with Renote phenomena, some of the like puffy, we call puffy ham, puffy, sorry, puffy finger. Allowing in the presence of ANA positivity. So whenever a patient present with you, they not have a finger and a test ANA, if it is found to be positive, about 95% patients are going to develop systemic sclerosis for a period of five years. This criteria is called video criteria, very early diagnosis of systemic sclerosis, which is very important in diagnosis of early systemic sclerosis. In addition to this test, because there are lot of antibodies in found in systemic sclerosis. Basically, we know two variants are the diffuse cutaneous and limited cutaneous. Now, in a diffuse cutaneous variant, we get MPL positivity with high prevalent of ILD. At the same time, in a limited variant, we have an anti antibody which patients have a least volume of ILD. However, patient centro centromy, they have a more chance to develop pulmonary artery hypertension. There are some antibodies that are not regulated in clinical practice. Anti PMSL antibody and anti THO, THO antibodies. This antibody has a strong basis to development of application, like anti U3 RNP antibody or we call anti fibrillary. There's a high chance to develop renal crisis. And this antibody is particularly associated with the development of malignancy. This is very important in diagnosis systemic sclerosis. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. My next question is for Dr. Aparjantan. So, sir, this was a patient of systemic sclerosis. It was a diagnosed case. Patient was on immunosuppression. And then the patient had concurrent tuberculosis. So, how do you go about it? Immunosuppression for CTD along with tuberculosis Patient is started on ATD, ATT, but then how do you go about the CTD management? Yeah, I think this question, the answer is fairly simple, but for the patient to undergo and for the clinicians to keep monitoring this is a more Herculean task. As you know, the patient is immunocompromised, so definitely has a more chance of getting the Cox disease. But once you start treatment, handling the drug interaction, monitoring for all the other organ adverse effects which can be compounded because of the interactions between the ATT and in your immune suppression and then maintaining a balance between your anti-infective therapy and your immune suppression are the three nightmares that the clinician needs to follow. So I think very simple way to go with it is that you continue to uh, you know, manage the CTD ILD with whatever immune suppressive drugs you're using. It's not necessary to take them off. Uh, regular drug monitoring of your immune suppression would definitely be required over here to make sure that you're not over immunosuppressing uh, these patients simultaneously because rifampicin has an interaction with many of these drugs. The conscious choice can be taken. Either one, you keep monitoring the drug levels and you keep monitoring for side effects or you take it, uh, you know, stab at it and switch from rifampicin to rifabutin, which and now uh, there is a lot of data, especially in the post-transplant patients, that is equally effective in managing a drug-sensitive tuberculosis. I'm not going into the drug-resistant tuberculosis here at all. So I think with careful monitorings between the balance, 
careful uh, look at the adverse effect profile con- finding that balance walking that thin line between immune suppression and the ATT would be the way to go forward Dr. Pa, do you generally use or do you use, if at all, the fampicin levels? Do you get them done in a patient who's on immunosuppression, say for CTD or for even post-lung transplant and who's also on ATD? Not rifampicin levels, but if uh, specifically, you know, if you're using tacrolimus in some of these patients, like there's a lot of data now with RAILD and with SSCILD, that tacrolimus is a good drug that can be used. Then, of course, the levels of tacrolimus uh, is something that I would like to follow rather than rifampicin levels in these patients. Dr. Murli Mohan, sir, this patient received cyclophosphamide for about four years and then was uh, shifted to mycophenolate, HCQ, omnocortil, also sildenafil and embrisentin were added when patient worsened. What is the initial agent of choice in systemic sclerosis ILD treatment? So once we made a definite diagnosis of uh, systemic sclerosis ILD, uh, if the patient is treatment naive, we would probably start with MMF. That would be our first choice, uh, gradually increasing it to two grams a day. I almost never go higher than two grams a day. I know our rheumatologists like to go up to three grams a day. At the same time, you know, one evaluates for uh, addition of, uh, especially if they have features like Raynaud's, put them on a vasodilator like uh, uh, nipedipine because that seems to help and you give them the standard advice of keeping the hands warm and so on. Uh, I also look at the uh, lungs and see if there's any evidence of fibrosis. If it looks like it's fairly aggressive, there's quite a lot of fibrosis. And we sometimes see this. It's amazing how late some patients come to us. Uh, and if you have the advantage of a previous CT or a previous lung function test, and we're seeing that this patient has a progressive ILD, I would probably use nintadanib fairly early. And where, you know, I have not used it up front and I'm seeing progression, then I would certainly initiate nintadanib. Uh, some of the other drugs that we have tried, uh, if, you know, uh, if you look at the literature, is uh, cyclophosphamide. I honestly have not been very comfortable using cyclophosphamide. I think MMF is a far easier drug to use, better tolerated by patients. So my first choice is always MMF with or without nintadanib, with or without uh, nifedipine. Okay. Thank you, sir. Now, Dr. Vindyachal, so you see how we pulmonologists think and you see how a great pulmonologist like Dr. Muli Mohan sir thinks and practices. And we'd like to hear the, our rheumatology opinion as well. When do you plan to upscale treatment and how do you choose class of drugs in systemic sclerosis, ILD? No doubt the first-line treatment is MMF, no doubt. We also use MMF as a first-line treatment. But uh, now the scenario is detecting early early cases of ILD, systemic sclerosis. Uh, uh, literature by Dr. Dinesh Khanna is one of the pioneers in systemic sclerosis. I put out a dis- distinguished ILD as a subclinical ILD and clinical ILD. Subclinical ILD, when the patient is or normal T, patient can be distinguished who are at high risk of progression of ILD, who are low patient for rapid skin involvement, diffuse cutaneous sclerosis, patient who are positive MPO positivity, patient who have a percent risk to positive activity. This patient can be put on tocilizumab. There is a central cell focused acid which has tocilizumab in an early systemic sclerosis patient So we will move on and take this talk further. So we talked about these We talked about the agents, but we also talked about how some agents can 
of from the cosmetic company. This patient developed gangrene. Also, this patient developed aortic thrombosis. My question is to Dr. Mohan Mohan sir: Could this be drug induced, and are systemic cosmetic patients at increased risk of thrombosis? So yes, there is. I think a very definite increase in the risk of thrombosis, risk of thrombosis. typically a venous thrombosis. You know that is far more common. We tend to see venous thrombosis. We tend to see uh, uh, pulmonary embolism. Uh, reports are somewhat mixed, but by and large, most people agree that there is an increased risk of venous thromboembolism in these patients. The bigger question is. you know this patient had aortic thrombosis and that is a little unusual we don't usually see too much of uh, arterial thrombosis in patients with systemic sclerosis but there are isolated case reports including i was looking at a, a report that said there was aortic thrombosis fairly large uh, thrombus in the aorta uh, so i think it's important to remember that peripheral vascular disease is very common in systemic sclerosis venous thrombosis is not uncommon pulmonary embolism can occur aortic thrombosis obviously can happen especially when there are antibodies like apla and so on which predispose to arterial thrombosis but this is not that common so if you have a pure sscild without any evidence of apla then perhaps you shouldn't expect uh, a very high chance of the high risk of the patient developing arterial thrombosis but if the patient has apla whether it's the apla which is causing it or the systemic sclerosis that's causing it difficult to say we must remember that you know while we like to put patients in convenient boxes of sscii systemic sclerosis rheumatoid arthritis and so on there's a lot of overlap between many of these which don't conform to a very definite overlap well defined overlap syndrome so i'd say yes slightly increased risk not that common as venous thromboembolism but yes arterial thromboembolism it has uh, has a higher risk in patients with systemic sclerosis this patient was also on silastazole so i want to ask that generally silastazole is not used in patients with lv dysfunction this patient did not have lv dysfunction lv function was normal but there was ra irv dilatation so this is purely i am asking because i have seen such cases and i don't use silastazole silastazole because i scared i don't know is it safe to use it in a patient with right ventricular strain patterns and with rv rv dilatation i don't see much of a problem i mean i'll welcome i'm no expert in silastazole also i'm not going to comment beyond saying that because it's predominantly a peripheral vessel active drug it shouldn't really affect the uh, a person with Uh, right heart failure rarv dilatation uh, if anything it may have some benefit but it's really a very very minor effect i honestly don't know how effective it is uh, and whether it's going to cause much of a problem i i would not have no hesitation in using it for this patient any you are you probably know more about this than i do so uh, because there was nothing else that could be done for this patient so we actually took a stab and we started the therapy although we did not see any difference from the therapy there was no harm to the uh, patient but uh, anyways there was no benefit uh, uh, by using the silastazole therapy all right thank if you if you permit me to ask uh, kirat can i just ask uh, dr vidya chel if he would prefer nintedanib or would you prefer silastazole you know one is a much better peripheral vasodilator so for peripheral vascular disease and systemic sclerosis no, no i think we still are not able to get dr bidyanchal so we'll we'll ask him personally bin, Let's go I ahead think, i think he can hear us dr bidyanchal could you i'm here sir yeah i'm hearing you sir yeah could you please answer please that please answer that yeah uh, for particularly vasoclusive disease in a patient with a systemic sclerosis sir yes which which would you prefer a calcium channel blocker or uh, silastazole you know something like nifed uh, nifedipine or silastazole no only sir calcium channel blocker we always prefer sir nifedipine calcium blocker when it is ineffective add on therapy sir we add ecosprin we can add oxetin ssri we can have sildenafil sir even bosent has for healing of bitter ulcers they are no have we go for a iloprost injection sir if a threatening if it is a threatening gangrene sir yes sir these are the prefer modes to treat sir renort phenomena and ulcer sir 
so you would use continuous continuous first uh, infusion so this infusion is given for days the this 2 mg microgram per kg body weight we given over a period of 24 hours days because this treatment we have because we are only giving high dose in this nation when clear the go for top injection we used to give in apollo and in the clinic practice we are using uh, thank you sir coming to dr pratibha dr pratibha since systemic sclerosis is a very crippling disease what can be done to pick disease early so we can obviously control the disease early So I think uh, Dr. Bindachal has already said that there is some differentiation where you can predict patients who are going to have progression to uh, internal organ involvement when they have puffy fingers, ANA positive and SSC positive have a higher progression. But I think when even there is some, there is one paper of 2021, which was looking at predictors and incidence of progression uh, of early systemic sclerosis to advanced disease. And they found that even patients who just had fit the criteria of early progression and did not really fit the criteria of, um, uh, you know, confirmed conclusive systemic involvement of uh, systemic sclerosis. When they screened these patients, a large 42% of them had pulmonary function abnormality, even at that point in time when they were not symptomatic for lung functions, they had some CT scan abnormalities. And a lot of them also had esophageal dysmotility, which was not uh, picked up symptomatically. So there is some evidence to show that a screening protocol when you have patients with uh, just skin manifestations, digital manifestations, that they should undergo a detailed uh, evaluation, which would include not just the history, maybe a CRP, do a, a specific uh, SEC autoantibodies, do an X-ray chest, a CT scan, a pulmonary function assessment. In some patients, uh, OGD, uh, upper endoscopy, and a capilloscopy OD performed, though I'm not sure how often we are doing it. So I think a basic workup when you have a patient who has presented with skin manifestations, even if it is early systemic sclerosis, they should undergo uh, all these investigations and include a, a echocardiography in this list because you can pick up early evidence of internal organ manifestation, which would benefit therapy because we have already discussed in the last 20 minutes or so how systemic sclerosis uh, mortality is very high and it is a progressive disorder. Very well said, ma'am. And coming from early progression, let's talk about end-stage disease. So this is for Dr. Appar. So, so this patient was on ATOT in 2016. By, uh, by 2021, he was on 8 liter L per minute LTOT. And by 2020, by the time 2023 came about, he was on he was on 10 liters of oxygen, 10 liters per minute with a non-rebreathing mask. So when do you label a case of ILD as end stage lung disease? And what is the ideal time to enroll a case of end-stage lung disease in lung transplant program? So I think the two questions are very, uh, you know, very related. Uh, I am not aware if any particular definition for the term end-stage lung disease has been rolled out from any of the societies. And, you know, Dr. Murli, uh, Pratibha, Dr. Shahjan, you can correct me if I'm wrong over there. Uh, but typically speaking, uh, when we look at it from a transplant point of view, there are a few points. There are two uh, basic points that we consider. And that is the time when we label these patients as an end stage lung disease patient. Point number one would be that there is about an 80 percent likelihood that the patient would die of the current disease if lung transplant is not performed within a period of the next two years. So this is one of the most important criteria. And the second is an extrapolation of the success of the program, which says that given that the graft function remains good, there is more than 90% likelihood that after the lung transplantation, the patient would live for a period of five years at least. So you're offering not only a morbidity, not only a quality of life benefit, also straight out you're offering a, a mortality benefit of twice 
at least twice the uh, number of years that the patient would survive in case the transplantation is not done. Very colloquially, <clears throat> we also go by the FEC values that once your FECs have started following less than 50% or once you see disease progression with, uh, you know, um, with worsening its symptomatology and unacceptability of the disease uh, versus quality of life for the patient despite adequate medical therapy. And when I say ad despite adequate medical therapy, it includes uh, drugs, it includes oxygen therapy, and it includes pulmonary rehabilitation. Once all three have been instituted, but still the patient continues to worsen, I think that would be the stage when you would call it as an end-stage lung disease. And this would be the right time that you would enroll the patient into the lung transplant program. There's a very common question recently, uh colleague doctor asked me and some patient they had this, this doctors in US and was uh, asking for a patient in India that the patient is 64 years old. I'm not going to talk about the primary diagnosis of this patient, but said, is it too late to get a lung transplant? So I would like to ans I would like you to talk about that, Dr. Apar, because this is a question that's in the minds of many doctors Across if, if you look at the average age of the patients that undergo transplants at our centers, this patient is way too young. He's in a toddler stage for you know the cohort that we have. So the average age of the patients that we get is uh, about 62 to 65 over here. Uh, most of these are ILD cases. Very few COPDs <laughs> are nowadays being referred for transplants. More and more, we see the ILDs coming in. And uh, as, as you know, it's a disease of the later uh, decades of the life. So we see older patients. But, you know, as the guidelines say, age, there is no set bar. You know, the uh, eldest, uh, and this is a report for 2021 from Canada, where they transplanted a 96-year-old lady. And the lady did survive for two years after the transplant as well. Uh, so there is no age limit that has been set. It is all the disease activity and the functional status of the patient. Once the patient undergoes assessment, it is the risk assessment for the surgical outcome, which dictates whether or not the patient can undergo a transplant. Different uh, methodologies can be employed. You can get away with a single lung transplant for a very old patient so as to re reduce the morbidity, reduce the, uh, you know, enhance the recovery time after the surgery. But yes, uh, there are multiple nuances to that, that there should not be uh, severe pulmonary hypertension. The patient should be in good physical condition. So depending upon all those things, age alone cannot be a deciding criteria whether or not a patient can undergo a lung transplant. Thank you. Can I ask a question to Apar in this context only? So yes, considering in the Indian scenario, Apar, that we are still a long way in the transplant program and we are still sometimes struggling with organ availability of uh, the lungs would i mean is there something that we would look at i mean would you transplant a 96 year old lady i, I know there is data but <laughs> you know because when at the cleveland clinic i think they had put cut put a cut off limit so that they could give the lung uh, organs to younger you know uh, people but i don't know how uh, whether we have some uh, indian guidelines to suggest this or it is set to center and based on experience Pratibha, let me make two points over here. The first point would be, see, we have had a wide range. So the youngest that we transplanted was a four-year child from Ukraine. And the eldest that we've transplanted was an 83-year-old man. And uh, this was during the COVID pandemics. It was a COVID ARDS that underwent a mm -hmm. transplant and the patient is still alive. So uh, I don't think following strictly the age criteria is what we look at. As I said, we look at the physical fitness of the patient. Now, the second thing is there is a huge divide between what the reality is and what the thought process is. You know, we uh, think that at the transplant centers, there is a huge queue. There are about thousands of patients waiting to undergo transplants, but that is not the reality. If you look at the organ availability and if you look at the number of uh, recipients that are actually enrolled at any of the four or five, you know, actively transplanting centers across the country, the lists are not huge. At my center, currently, I have a list of about 36, 37 Indian patients and another 40 international patients, which is a huge list in itself. But then given this list, I am able to offer an organ to most of these patients within an average period of about two to three months, which again by itself, if you look at the Western standards, the UK standards or the US standards, is a very, very short waiting period. Correct. So, Correct. You know, uh, I mean, deciding because of age, 
that whether or not this patient should be given a lung i don't think we have reached so i think at this point because we don't have that many referrals going to you guys i think as as more and more referrals happen maybe you all will and your wait time increases maybe then you all will have to you know screen patients like if you have the same kind of waiting list like you have in the western world where uh, you know it could be as high as 6 months maybe then the screening will become more stringent totally agreed So, Dr. Pratibha, some of course we must also visit. remember that Toronto t- tends to push the envelope on all these things. Yeah, so ninety <laughs> six, no other place would do it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Dr. Kiran, go ahead, please. So, Dr. Pratibha, moving in this context, which CTD ILDs would respond better to lung transplant? Okay, so although it is not, I don't have much experience in it, but whatever I have read. there has been some concern about uh, you know having uh, non scleroderma uh, ctd ild faring worse than uh, scleroderma and there was an article in journal of heart lung transplant where they did a study of comparing non systemic sclerosis uh, ild undergoing transplant with ipf since ipf has been the first one to get transplanted i think most of the data is in comparison with ipf and then they found that compared to ipf there was no significant difference in outcomes so that concern relating to uh, ctd ild faring poorly because of immune dysregulation and uh, other organ involvements is not true now systemic sclerosis per se i think there are other factors to be looked into like esophageal dysmotility which has increased risk of aspiration and uh, therefore there was some concern about these patients faring not as well as other uh, ctds but i think there is some recent data which says that the 1 to 5 year survival is similar to as seen in ipf patients and the certain things that you will need to rule out which transplant centers are doing very stringently is to rule out any intrinsic renal disease to look at uh, and control the esophageal uh, motility measures which i think apar in his slide had very well put up that they do study these things very extensively and i'm sure because this is a transplant center they have they do all these things which a lot of us don't land up doing all these uh, measurements for uh, esophageal motility so i think that is uh, good to see there was a small uh, study uh, it was study by yang in 221 where they reported that the polymyositis dermatitis had a slightly higher incidence of primary graft dysfunction and higher icu stay compared to uh, ipf patients post transplant and um, a slightly lower survival as compared to uh, ipf so i don't know what is our i don't think we are at this point referring a lot of these patients uh, to you apart for a transplant i think it is mostly ra and systemic sclerosis that is coming to you so i'm not sure how our data is in uh, relation to this so i would like his comments on this for sure so pratibha if i'm to talk about the pmdm uh, variety of the ctd i mm. my yes. and my experience is very limited it is limited to two patients there was a patient uh, one which was uh, lifted from the defense hospital in pune and the other patient that i had from delhi and both the patients did not survive the transplant so as you said there was severe primary graft dysfunction there was a very early antibody mediated rejection that both the patients developed and a uh, large part of it could be because of the uh, you know preformed panel reactive antibodies which were at very high levels in these patients prior to the transplant itself so still uh, you know a lot of uh, research is going on lot of data collection is going on we don't know why these differences are there but definitely as a thumb rule if you look at the ishlt data it has shown slightly uh, better survival in ctd ilds as compared to the uh, ipfs where you know the median survival is between 7.9 versus 6.3 years now post transplant but yes amongst the ctd ild as you very rightly put the pmdm variety fares the worst followed by uh, the uh, you know the scleroderma variety and then the others thank you dr apar i would now i want to ask more questions but i think we should quickly go through the questions that the audience is putting in that they're piling up most of the questions have been answered already but i would like to mention that questions have been sent in by dr k h reddy from arisa from semili guda and dr katham chandra shekhar <laughs> from telangana and they're asking about cardiomyopathy dealing with cardiomyopathy 
in systemic sclerosis so who can who would like to take this uh, dr gupta perhaps dr bindyachal how much do you deal with cardiac issues cardiomyopathy in scleroderma <laughs> drug induced or perhaps primary disease hello yes sir yes sir Yes. Yeah, cardiomyopathy uh, can be seen in systemic sclerosis. It is very rare. Very rare. It is seen in subcutaneous systemic sclerosis who are positive and have positivity. Normally, uh, involved of cardiac take place in form of pericardial and myocardial effusion, along with fibrosis, which can affect the myocardium as well as the conductive tissue. The conduction tissue involvement led to arrhythmias and cardiac conduction abnormal. Involvement of myocarditis led to dysfunction. most common thinly weak on gastric dysfunction as well as some patient may develop left ventricular failure also how but it is very very rare to develop uh, such a case very very rare i have never seen a patient with a, a systemic sclerosis develop cardiomyopathy it is mentioned but very very rare very rare okay so next question dr okay. okay. next one from from kamde from maharashtra from maharashtra immunomodulator of choice for sle dr bindyachal when you go uh, aps the uh, first line treatment is sle it is given life long and the primary drug is mmf and is the drug which are using in sle it works beautifully in all the many patients suffering from sle Whether it's kidney, lung, with kidney, SP effect, except joint disease, F is the first treatment in SLE. So this, thank so you. This, thank you. Next question is from uh, Dr. Ruby Joseph from Karnataka, from Bengaluru. Uh, Dr. Ruby is asking whether we should do a uh, whether it would merit to do uh, HRCT in a zero negative RA patient with nocturnal cough. being treated for gerd and on auscultation no pulmonary no findings i think we should do an hrct at least yes. a baseline hrct is to be done so we can find early changes early the earlier we pick up the disease the more aggressive we can be with the management absolutely so next, next question is from dr tridip chatterji our ardent member dr tridip is asking uh, he's from mumbai is asking how commonly have you seen typical ctd ild changes like exuberant hernicomic straight edge sign etc i am pretty early in my career as a pulmonologist and sir even i have seen cases with very bad extensive hernicomic i would like some senior to comment on this dr pratibha perhaps i think we see it reasonably common but we probably don't pick it up because we are not that uh vigilant also i think some of these signs a lot of our radiologists also forget to report it when they are reporting their uh ct scan and trip as you know we are spoiled we have bhavan and mumbai so we we pick up a lot of these things uh because of reports that are reviewed by him uh, but yes i think uh, i mean looking at ct uh ct scan pictures of the various types of uh, CTD ILD, I think, is like a webinar in itself. I mean, it is quite and because there are so many varied patterns of predominant uh, pattern plus what drug changes it can cause superimposed. But yes, we do see a straight edge sign. In I mean, I think in maybe one out of every five uh, CT scan, we would see that. Doctor Trib is also asking how well does mesenten mesenten Ambrosial enough will help in reducing pH in PTD related pH. Doctor Murli, perhaps you would like to answer this. Yeah. So as we discussed earlier, it depends on which. Uh, what is the underlying cause of the pulmonary hypertension? If it's group one predominantly, and I think Raja referred to this when he spoke about the CPET. So we look at the CT. We see extensive lung disease. Uh, we do the lung functions. We find a very low FVC. we find the person is hypoxic then i don't think we should be using any of these pulmonary vasoactive drugs on the mm -hmm. other hand and this was interesting because mm -hmm. i think uh, 
you know, Apar's case showed a dilated pulmonary artery, but in the presence of quite a lot of lung disease. I would say here the pulmonary hypertension is predominantly due to the lung disease, and I would not be using the uh, Macitentan or Abricentan or one of those. If on the other hand, I had not seen so much lung disease, and uh, I think Dr. Shahjan mentioned this, you see a lot of, or uh, Apar mentioned this, you see a lot of mosaic attenuation in the presence of a dilated uh, pulmonary artery, then I would certainly consider using Macitentan or Ambrisentan. I mean, that's an individual choice, which ERA, but I would definitely start with two drugs. That's the emphasis now. Combined therapy with at least two classes of drugs, uh, an ERA, an endothelial receptor antagonist, and a PD-5 inhibitor. And then if necessary, add on a third one later. So, not in all cases of pulmonary hypertension, decide on whether you, which group you're dealing with and then use the drug appropriately. Thank you, sir. So Dr. Suresh, who's a very senior pulmonologist from Chandigarh Tri-City from Mohali, he's asking, is Embry Sentin justified in RA ILD? So, sir, you just answered that. Um, so we also have questions from Dr. Chandra Khan Tarke from Telangana, Hyderabad. Any specific criteria to differentiate between methotrexate-induced ILD and RA ILD. So, so can I answer take? that? Yes, usually. Please. So, usually methotrexate-induced ILD usually has more of an organizing pneumonia or a alveolitis pattern and less commonly it has a fibrotic pattern. So, if you are looking at a predominant, you have a patient who's presented to you the first time with dyspnea has never had a CT scan evaluated before and is already on methotrexate for his arthralgias and is having a CT pattern predominantly of a fibrotic type, then you are thinking more in terms of the primary disease, rheumatoid arthritis causing that pattern. If it, there is a superimposed organizing pneumonia pattern with a, or an alveolitis pattern with diffuse DGOs where there is a recent history of uh, worsening, then you, you could think of a drug-induced uh, you know, factor uh, superimposed on the underlying lung disease. And when you stop the drug, the patient improves also. Yes. Yeah, that's also common with the methotrexate. Yeah. So there and when in doubt, stop because, you know, you have alternatives. Yes. Thank you, sir. Sir, so we have questions from Dr. Parvat Kumar Sahu, Orisa Bhuvaneshwar, from Dr. Sri Ram, from Maharashtra Nandir, Dr. Keval, Dang, Rajasthan, Kota, uh, and so the, a few more. And their question is revolving around antifibrotics versus immunosuppressants. So may I ask um, Dr. Pratiba, Dr. Shah Jahan to please, Dr. Shah Jahan first, can antifibrotics be prescribed in non-IPF cases? Uh, antifibrotics were classically described in uh, IPF. We all know that. But now we uh, there is an increase in interest, uh, renowned interest in non-IPF issues also, especially, especially so, so fibrosis, fibrosis uh, lung disease. And this actually and came this from the impulsis trial initially, because in impulsis trial meant for IPF, but somehow some non-IPF cases were also included in that. It also improved. So that again then inbuilt came, came leaf uh, trial came, census trial came for uh, uh, systemic sclerosis all shows that there is a modest improvement in FEC or at least uh, there is a, a reduction in the decline of FEC. So naturally uh, uh, these agents are uh, recommended but in selective cases also these reagents are shown to uh, shown that there is a decrease in the incidence of exacerbation also. So uh, this uh, antifibrotic has also got a definite role in the armamentary of non-IPF cases also, but we have to do it with caution. Thank you, sir. Dr. Pratiba, any closing remarks? I think there is a lot of debate and discussion happening on progressive pulmonary fibrosis. And there is recent ATS ERS joint statement, which has been released, which is defining this, uh, this entity. However, I think this is something which is in, uh, you know, it is something which is an evolving concept. But yes, at this point, any patient who is progressing clinically, symptomatically, lung function-wise with a drop in FEC or a drop in DLCO with a CT progression in the fibrosis, one would add an antifibrotic and would label it as far as the current definition, what has been provided to us 
by the uh, international guidelines is limited to the fact that you are saying that we have to wait for one year for this progression. But I think if a patient is progressing rapidly, that is more worrisome. And maybe in future course, whether you should call progression only if it is progression over one year, what is progression at three months, there is a lot of debate happening internally amongst all these elite group of people who are uh, doing these trials and making these definitions. But yes, any progression, I would think we would consider antifibrotics because we know that this disease, you know, I mean, we know that these diseases have very high morbidity and mortality. Thank you, Dr. Pratibha. Thank you, dear panelists. I can only say how much pleasure it brings to me to be able to connect with everyone. And I'll tell you what CCI has done, the way we are connected over knowledge sharing and also networking. I recently had a patient, uh, Dr. Pratibha, you had done EBUS TBNA for this patient, diagnosed this patient with sarcoidosis in 2008. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So this he had the reports and when I saw those papers, I can only tell you it made me very happy to know that I know you and the, that I could tell the patient that, oh, yes, I know her. She's amazing. You know? Thank you. And I think that must be a conventional TBNA. I don't think I was doing EBUS in 2008, but yes, that is even more heartening. That before EBUS happened, we had diagnosis on conventional modalities. I assume maybe you in Mumbai, <laughs> maybe you had it. So. <laughs> and then I can tell you how happy it makes me when my husband, Nikhil, who's a radiologist, insists that he must attend Dr. Murli's talk. He must, ins he must attend even his chat with the stalwart. You know, so the fact that even across specialties, we are connected. The fact that we have a rheumatologist with us to discuss and to really, it really broadens our spectrum of knowledge sharing and networking and to have a lung transplant pulmonologist like Dr. Apar with us, to have a professor of pulmonary medicine from Alafuza, a place which I have never visited. So it's it's really most heartening. Welcome. And you are most welcome to the Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And thank you for a wonderful panel, all of you, um, our most respected and esteemed panelists thank you so much and thank you to our live audience of 1000 plus thank you for being with us till the end from the beginning thank you so much good night everyone i do want to put in a word for kirat because i think she stepped in last minute as a moderator i think raja was supposed to do it initially and then there were multiple back and forths between who's going to do it but when everybody refused she stepped in very graciously three days ago and she's done a wonderful job Thank you, ma'am. Thank Absolutely. you so much. You did a great job. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Good, Good night. night. Bye-bye. Good night, everyone. Bye. And thank you, CCI, for this opportunity. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.